On Keel Appear via the Jack Spring Electric Keel Newsmaker Hotline, Ms. Maxine Crump is the president and CEO of Dialogue on Race, Louisiana. Hey, Ms. Maxine, welcome back to Keel. Thank you for joining us. Um, sure. My Good pleasure, morning. ma'am. Let, let's start here because it's a term everybody's heard a lot the last week or 10 days or so, and it's systemic racism. Explain to us what that means, what that is. Hmm. Um. Systemic racism is the system of race that was constructed. In other words, the term um, white, black, um, these, these color groupings were specifically set up in this country. And uh, white was the preferred color and was also ranked. So it's a ranking of human, of a, a, a hierarchy human hierarchy, and institutions were empowered to um, legally uh, carry out the protection from these people of color uh, being able to move through the system at will. Institutions could say, we don't hire your color. Restaurants could say, you don't, we don't serve you because it was legal. Once the system was made illegal, the practices continued because the law that made it illegal was a civil law that said, uh, if you believe that you're being discriminated, you can file a lawsuit. But the law that was put in place to protect whiteness was a law that was criminal and police could enforce it. You know, it seems like everything I've heard the last couple of weeks and beyond is we've come a long way, but... It, 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 systemic racism has america come a long way or do you disagree with that when when somebody prefaces a statement with we've come a long way do you disagree with that or agree i agree with that if you have a cold and you're better in six days pretty good you had a cold if you have lung cancer it may take a lot longer and it could come back it depends on the level of what you call a long way and if a long way means that we have come far enough, <clears throat> then what's wrong with all these people all over the world that's saying racism still exists, <clears throat> there are still barriers in place, maybe people don't see them if they're not up against the barrier. But those who are of color, particularly African Americans who were uh, descendants of, of the slave system, <clears throat> they experience barriers every day. And if you ask them, some of them, the younger people, have come to where they don't quite see them. But if your interstate was built in the 50s, it was legal to build the bridge part of the interstate over communities of color. And the information in the um, application, the, the, the loan application for federal matching dollars from the federal government only needed to explain why they chose that area. And the answer across the country was, these are undesirable areas. And, and it's things like that. If, that. if that bridge over area is still there, it's still having an impact on those communities. And you can look at it in the studies. Those are the communities that are considered uh, the crime, drugs, and bad communities. What people don't know when they look back is those communities weren't that way until the bridge over part. So it, it, institutional racism uh, isn't, uh, and systemic racism isn't always what everyone sees. It depends on where they are, but the impact is still there. Maxine Crump, the dialogue, dialogue on race. It feels to me like this latest uh, movement, if you will, is different. It's bigger, it's lasted longer, and could have what, I, what sounds like a real impact. Are you feeling the same way about what's happening in the nation? I am, because I think uh, one of the things that you might hear uh, some people say, because they're just quoting words from the past, they say people are sick and tired. I think I'm hearing a different tone from the protest. I'm hearing them say, not this time. In other words, we're not going to just get out here and protest and go home. We're going to demand systemic change. And I've not heard any protest in the past say so clearly, we demand justice and systemic change. That is new. And the, the who is joining the protest now is new including some police officers um, and, and many people who are white, way over what people expected 
uh, at this time. Yes, it, it, it is. And, um, and to focus on the message of the protest is what y'all are doing, which is a valuable thing. The demands that are, have been made, um, I'll, I'll just hone in on our community, about a, um, a citizens review board on excessive force and things like that um, sound very reasonable. And then you hear in other communities where we want to disband a police department. Um, is there some middle ground between the two? I think that before anybody decide what ground to, to settle with there, they need to make sure they're hearing what those messages are. That's what we do in Dialogue on Race. And by the way, there's a charter entry report through the uh, YWCA of Northwest, which is going great. And, and so, uh, in, in other words, if we look at it from outside, we say, well, those don't sound like reasonable demands. Well, you, if you're listening from the outside, that's not well enough. You have to listen to where people are coming from. And then there can be some sort of uh, settlement of where we can land. But if the, if the demand is extreme, it's because there's been an extreme background getting to this point, and people are standing in that extreme. And if you're on the outside, you won't know they're extreme. You have to sit and talk with people in, in both camps and see where they're coming from. Aaron had mentioned to me, and you've been on with us a couple of times before, um, Aaron had mentioned to me that you started this, the, the dialogue on race, Louisiana, I think it was nearly two decades ago. Uh, in those two decades, yeah. when, when you compare, say, 19, good heavens, uh, uh, the year 2000 to now, and, and you see things like George Floyd continue to happen, do you kind of just feel like I haven't done anything in 20 years? That must be terribly frustrating and painful for you. No, I'm not that blind. I see change. I really do. And, and, and uh, let's go back to just uh, the, the, the nonviolent movement of the 60s when people were well-dressed and walking and carrying signs. And the actual system, the police turned dogs loose on the marches because they weren't marching without a permit, that sort of thing. Now... The system isn't um, isn't actually deciding that the march shouldn't happen and that they don't have a permit. The system is mostly saying just don't tear down things, and so that's different right there. But but in when we first started this in the '90s, people would say, well, we don't really need a dialogue on race. We we have the civil rights law, and people are getting along. We have uh, with a diversity program. People of color work here. And, and that's, that's very tone deaf because people of color are citizens. African Americans are American citizens. Asian Americans are American citizens. All of these colors, Hispanic Americans are American citizens. And it shouldn't be what white people permit people of color to have. What a lot of people are blind to is systemically there are barriers in place that have been in, left in place that we don't see. We need to start looking at where those barriers are. The exciting thing is some companies are. They're asking themselves, well, let me check and see what barriers I may have. People are saying there are barriers. I can't walk around and say, well, I don't see any. Let people show you what they're seeing. And these kinds of conversations can bring about that. Change. You know, I, I know, I'm sure this is a question you get all the time. In fact, I'm, I'm pretty sure I asked you this uh, one of the times you were with us, is that when you hear the term systemic racism, in a city like Shreveport, where we have a black mayor and we've had a black police chief and black fire chief, we have in Caddo Parish an African American district attorney, et cetera. How how can how can systemic racism continue to exist in a system in a city like Shreveport, which is majority African American, and there's a lot of uh, uh, African Americans in city government? The um, the city government founding fathers up until that first black mayor was elected were all white. When systems are put in place, they don't go away when the next person comes in. They don't just die out. The people in those positions have to navigate those systems. And if the system has been constructed with a lot of barriers, color barriers in the system, no one can do that in their election because anybody elected in that position is going to be uh, dealing with the budget that's there. And if the budget in the past has never been lined item out to, to – um, Fix systemic uh, res uh, residuals of um, poor schools and and many other things that have left areas where where people of color live uh, depleted, 
and 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 the budget has never been lying item out for that because it is seen as those people did that to their community, not including recognizing that white flight and resources were were drained out of those communities suddenly and sometimes gradually and left that way. And opportunities for jobs and, and, and loans and things like that is not is part of the, those barriers. So when a, an elected official has to navigate the current budget that has been left over, that has been a tradition for years, it will be hard for any African-American elected official to come in and make major changes. Because in the first place, one of the things would be, are you the mayor of the entire city or are you just the mayor of black people? Hmm. So they, there's a lot to navigate. And I think we would be asking a lot to ask a black elected official to fix this problem that's been there for decades. What can a, a business owner, a white business owner or white folks who have control of, of uh, workplace, what can they do if they're listening to you today and they're like, I want to do what I can to help, but I don't know what to do. What can they oh, do? That's great. That's, that's great. Well, the, the, the best thing you can do is make a decision. The worst thing uh, and, and, and the second best thing you can do is um, uh, the wrong thing. And the third worst thing you can do is nothing. So you can't just sit there and ask and then do nothing. You've got to decide and, um, and, and make sure you don't do the worst thing. So I think that uh, if, if businesses are asking themselves that, they have moved way into it. Because, because then if you ask yourself that, then try to identify that problem. What we're working on right now with Dialogue on Race Louisiana is a measurement tool for companies to be able to survey their company and ask themselves questions that will give them a visibility. Because when we talk about the economy, we measure the outcome. We don't measure the intent of the economy. And so if, if companies are going to talk about what kind of outcome they want for their company, they have to measure at the outcome level. So we want to give them a measurement tool that helps them survey where their operation can be um, uh, systemically causing, uh, having barriers that they haven't seen. Because much of racism is unintentional, unconscious, and un definitely invisible. Mm -hmm. But the outcome is visible. And so that's, there's a way to measure that. We're working on that tool. But I think they need to just ask themselves that question, where here can I find it? And, and listen honestly for the answer. Gotcha. Because it's there. Maxine Crump, Dialogue on Race, Dialogue on Race, Louisiana. The local YWCA has these sessions, and um, I encourage folks to to go look it up and and take part. It really is a, a big eye opener. Thanks for your time. My pleasure. Mm -hmm. One on one.